<laughs> I am Staff Sergeant Field at the 22nd Operational Weather Squadron, the weather flight here. And what we do here, uh, it's pretty important stuff. Mostly we are uh, protecting the pilots during their training flights that they go on uh, all around the world, usually uh, starting here, going anywhere from, I don't know, uh, Maine to Western uh, the United States into Hawaii, all the way over to Europe. Uh, all over the world and we're supporting their flights by providing weather support for them, telling them what to expect uh, during their flight, whether it's turbulence or thunderstorms or icing that'll accumulate on the aircraft. Uh, so basically we're keeping them safe uh, in, that, in that aspect. Uh, the second part of our job is called resource protection and what that involves is protecting the assets that we have here, uh, meaning the, air, the aircraft. Um, while they're on the ground, not flying, and also the, the people working and the families uh, living on base and in the immediate area as well by providing um, warnings and when we issue the tornado siren and things like that, just uh, protecting you guys, telling you when it's, uh, when it's time to duck and cover because of weather coming in. So that's pretty much what we do here. And did you want to show us some of the, the equipment you guys use to yeah. keep track of the weather that's coming around us? Definitely. So if you want to come on over, we have um, a few different tools that we use. This here is one of our tools we use uh, for short-term forecasting and for observing. Uh, this is a radar image, and it, it basically loops over about an hour. So um, you'll see when it resets here, it's about an hour ago, up until about 10 minutes ago when it moves down. Um, down into uh, northern Arkansas here and basically it tells us um, what's going on in terms of weather you see the green usually indicates uh, some sort of, of rain um, yellow generally means that there might be a potential for lightning it, it all depends there's a lot of things to consider but basically that's what we look for and then over here on this side if you can see it's mostly uh, that's it tells us the wind uh, what the winds doing at different areas because um, the wind changes pretty frequently uh, with storms and whatnot. So that's one tool we use. Another tool that we use for observing for determining what's going on currently is satellite imagery. And it's, it's a little bit different from radar imagery um, in the sense that these are actually taken from satellites up in space and uh, they, they color the images based on temperatures and moisture. Uh, there's a lot of different types of images that we look at. It's, it's pretty complicated, uh, but generally it gives us a good overall view of what's happening. Um, we could see a lot of different pieces of information. For example, we can get, just like that, we have a whole overview of the United States. And what we use this for, one, is uh, to determine the intensity of storms is is a big uh, is a big topic, but we also use this to determine if uh, storms are building, because you can actually see over a short time span uh, clouds start to build up, and even just uh, in the summertime, even just the smallest puff of white over over our area could indicate. The, the start of a, of a thunderstorm building and it can it can happen very fast so this is uh, an important tool that we use because it can help us uh, prepare if we have to very quickly uh, so what we also do or use on the computer for our job is we use what we call model data and basically the best way to explain this is it's a computer that puts together 30 years of past weather data and 
it takes the current conditions that are happening and says, okay, well, right now, this is the temperature, this is the pressure, this is the, um, the humidity in these areas, and based on the 30 years, 30 past years of, uh, of weather events, this is the most likely thing that's going to happen. And we can, we can see, uh, breaks down into every three hours, uh, we can kind of track where the moisture and where the weather is expected to occur, and, or, or where it's expected, or not expected to occur, much like today, it's very nice out. So we can, we can deduce that, hey, there's gonna, there's, it's likely that there's gonna be uh, severe weather or inclement weather in the area, or hey, it's gonna be really nice today. So that's, uh, that's one thing that we use these for. And there's a lot of different things that we look at, a lot of different types of models that we use. Um, but, and, and it takes some time to build an accurate forecast, but this is one of our, our main tools that we use for forecasting if, and if, um, de deciding, figuring out what is most likely to happen. And this here is what we call a skew T. It looks really weird, I know, but it is uh, another really important tool that we use. And basically it's a snapshot of one location from the ground up to what we call the troposphere. It's the top of this layer of atmosphere that we're in up to about, um, about 40,000 feet up into the air. And it basically uh, tells us what the temperature is doing from the surface all the way up, and that's an important tool uh, because it'll help us decide, uh, figure out the potential for severe thunderstorms versus not severe thunderstorms, just a couple lightning strikes and, and baseball sized hail. So um, that's another important tool that we use. And uh, the last tool that we have is this little handy guy. This is called a Kestrel, and this is what we use uh, for observing if all of our computers go down. This is just in case of emergencies. It's always important to have a backup. So this is what we have here. It's very small. It's smaller than most cell phones, uh, but it does, it does a lot. Um, it has a little fan right here, and that, that uh, helps us figure out what the wind speed and the wind direction are. It tells us what the pressure is, um, tells us uh, like I said, wind speed, wind direction, temperature, the dew point, which is sort of like the humidity. Um, it tells us uh, like altitudes, and it keeps track of time and everything like that for us too. So uh, we can relay this information to important uh, agencies, for example, the air control tower, if they have aircraft landing and there is an emergency with uh, all of the, the computers being down and we can't use our systems to, to relay the important information like what the wind direction is coming from. Um, we can use this tool to get them that information. Um, and that is pretty much what we, what we use to do our job. There's a few other tools, but those, these are the main tools that we use here to complete our mission. Well, and so then how long do you guys have to train or go to school or what is what do you need to do to be able to learn to be able to do your job? Okay, well it was a little bit different when I was going through, but the the training consists of uh, the basic military training boot camp. Right after that we go to what we call tech school, which for us is located down in Mississippi. Um, we're there for, it's eight months, and that's five days a week, eight hours a day, learning just about weather. You know, a lot of a lot of times in school you learn about different subjects throughout the day and you get a little bit of a break from math or something. That's, mm -hmm. that's not the case. It's eight hours about science and weather every single day for, like I said, eight months. It's, it's exhausting and it's very much information. And the reason it's that long is because we don't know and they don't know at school where we're going to go to do our job. And the weather is different everywhere you go in the world. You could go to uh, Tucson, Arizona, which is my last duty station, where in the middle of the desert, it's super hot, uh, but you can also get those severe thunderstorms very quickly, and, um, and then the severe winds with that too. Or we could end up going to Alaska, where you get 
inches and feet of snow even, and that's uh, also detrimental to the mission. So we have to know, regardless of where we're going, how to forecast for those different situations uh, so we are prepared no matter where we go. So when you change duty stations, do you have to kind of do a refresher for the weather for that environment? Say you go to Alaska, you have to retake right. weather, winter weather precautions? Um, usually, usually there's local training involved with that. Mm -hmm. It's not like they have to send us back to school. Right. Uh, but it's usually uh, some computer-based training, like uh, learning online, distance learning, like uh, a lot of people did for, a lot, a lot of kids did for school. Uh, with the whole coronavirus, with the schools being shut down, a lot, a lot like that, but also, uh, also just learning on the job and, and and figuring out with the people that are more seasoned that have been there for a while, learning from them, and it's also a refresher in your head from what you learn from tech school. So it's not all brand new information, yeah. but uh, that that's another that's that's how we learn, uh, no matter where we go, how okay. to do our job. All right. Well, and you talked about uh, storms. This is summer in Kansas. We get tornadoes, hailstorms, yes. everything around the world. So, using your equipment, how far out can you predict a storm's coming to you? Uh, I discussed the models that we use on the computer, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them go out five to seven days. Okay. Uh, but the the thing is, how I how I mentioned that it takes the most current weather data or the 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 current conditions saying hey this is what's going on right now and based on the past 30 years of weather data where the conditions have been similar to this this is the most likely course of what the weather's going to do um, the further away from or I guess the, the farther out you're forecasting time wise the less accurate that data becomes okay. because uh, the atmosphere changes so rapidly and, and so extensively that it's difficult to track uh, really far into the future. Um, when it comes to giving the pilots their briefs, which we have to provide the information to them in just a couple hours within their departure. Uh, I think it's four, four and a half hours before their departure is when they're required to have that information. Mm -hmm. And so we try to wait as long as we can to get them that information to ensure that it's the most accurate product that we can give them. Uh, but in terms of severe weather, when we know a system is coming through and it might bring us tornadoes or severe thunderstorms, we try to give as much warning as possible so that people can be prepared and we issue um, changes to the forecast if necessary okay. depending on what we think is going to happen. All right. Um, and then another question, I guess, is, is do you, uh, when you guys find out there's bad weather, are you guys the ones who decide that the planes need to leave the base, or do you guys pass the information on to like the air control tower and then they decide who's grounded and who's not? So, <laughs> sorry, the process for this information, or for this, uh, yeah, for the information to get relayed is, so first we see that there's a potential for severe weather on the computers from this time to this time. Uh, from this day to this day, we actually get together as basically the base leadership and everyone that might have a decision to make or, or input gets together and we all decide, usually wing leadership, the base leadership um, decide together if we should evacuate the aircraft or not. All we do is we say, hey, this is the times and the days that we're looking for, these are the conditions, we might see a tornado, maybe a few tornadoes maybe large hail, but these are the conditions and that's what we're expecting. And then from there, it goes to the base leadership and they determine based on what we give them and a lot of other aspects. For example, um, what what the availability for other bases to house our aircraft, okay. if they have to evacuate, right. all that comes into play too. Sir? Okay. And then, um, this one was from one of our little guys that wanted to know, why do you guys watch the weather? What is the most important, I know you've said it kind of a little bit, what's little the bit. most important reason yes, you right. watch the weather? Uh, the most important, uh, it's tough to say, uh, like I said, we have we have two missions here. One is, is making sure that our pilots get enough training so they can, so they can refuel um, where they need to, but um, I think the most important part of what we do is keeping, keeping everyone safe. Um, by issuing, you know, tornado sirens and 
and giving all of our weather briefs that we give um, if we're expecting tornadoes. Um, you can look up tornado videos on YouTube or anywhere and you can find all the different types of destruction that they cause and it, it, honestly they're pretty terrifying mm -hmm. but that's why we're here is we we help you guys uh, we keep you guys safe by predicting those tornadoes and telling you when when they might hit or when they might not hit uh, so that you can live <laughs> okay. and so in okay, case so any of our little guys know, that's what a tornado siren is for. So when you do hear the tornado sirens, you gather your adults and go to a safe spot and make sure you stay safe. Do not go outside and play. Definitely. But definitely that's why weather's here is to help us figure out what's good weather, what's bad weather, when we can have sunshine, when we have rain. Um, but also Sergeant Field also has a cool science experiment. We're going to attempt to do in a little bit so if you guys want to hold on for just a second we'll be right back um, so this is a process that is involved when uh, when there's snowstorms and ice storms in the area uh, it's called uh, cloud condensation nuclei and the the idea behind cloud and con cloud condensation nuclei is that if there's water, what we call supercooled water, it's water that's below freezing but is not yet solid. It's not ice or it's not snow or anything like that. It's still liquid, but it's below freezing. And that that is possible if there's no cloud condensation nuclei. And it's basically a molecule that starts the whole freezing process. Um, that turns the liquid into a solid. And that's kind of how we get ice storms when um, precipitation, it, it rains, rains water um, in the winter time, but then when it, re when it hits the ground or it hits cars or usually metal surfaces like airplanes, it turns into ice. And that's when we get our, our ice storms, our Kansas, infamous Kansas ice storms. Uh, so this, is, this will sort of demonstrate the process, I, I hope. Um, so basically, the water is super cooled, it's, it's still essentially, and when it's disturbed or disrupted, um, it'll it'll kick off that process and, and turn to ice. So if you can get a little bit closer, hopefully this will work. Uh, basically, all you got to do is is disrupt the water in some way. For example, maybe banging it, and you can't really see it, but it's uh it's a little icy in there now. Um, not as not as dramatic as I was hoping for. <laughs> But you could try this at home. Um, all you got to do is you get a lukewarm bottle of water, uh, unopened, closed, and you keep it in, uh, in your freezer for about two and a half hours, two hours and 45 minutes. And then you very carefully take it out and uh, you basically, you can open it and you can bang it on a surface. You could just hit it with your hand and you can uh, watch it as, as the water crystallizes. It's, it's a really cool experiment. Unfortunately, it didn't quite turn out here. Um, it looks like it's got a little bit of crystallization in there, so. Yeah, it's yeah you just, can, it's you hard can to kind probably of, see. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's in the middle, and um, it, wasn't, it wasn't as cool as it needed to be, it was a problem. Um, but try this at home, definitely. It's, it's super cool, uh, super cool pun, anyways. <laughs> Uh, give it a shot and you can basically make your own ice storm in a water bottle so and you can put your experiment in the comments below and we'll share it with weather station see if you guys got it to work i'm very interested to see the results so please let us know hi everyone so this is another piece of equipment that we use for observing uh, it's called a tmq 53 and what it does, sort of like that Kestrel that we discussed earlier, that small handheld piece of equipment, this is basically a much larger, uh, same, same thing, just on, on a larger scale. And it, it does pretty much everything that our sensor is, is required to do. Uh, for example, we have lightning detection. It tells us where and how often lightning strikes occur. It tells us the visibility, uh, what type of weather is occurring, for example, what kind of precipitation, uh, snow or rain or, or ice storms or, or something like that. Uh, we have uh, rain gauge. It tells us how much precipitation, uh, temperature, a thermometer, a dew point. It tells us the relative humidity. 
And if you look up top, that's what we call an anemometer. And that tells us the wind speed and direction. And it rotates based on the wind. Uh, we have a sealometer, which is what we use to determine cloud bases um, and the, the uh, amount of cloud coverage that we have. And that's pretty much it. It's, it's a really, uh, really important tool because it is, uh, it's all inclusive. It does, it does a lot and we're able to pack it up into a few suitcases that we can take with us wherever we need to go with it. And we can set it up and um, we, we have stakes that keep it solid so it doesn't move around in the, in the severe weather. Um, and it's, it's, it's mainly solar powered, so that's important too. And it connects wirelessly to a computer that we have inside to relay that information to us so that we can have constant eyes on the weather uh, occurring. So that's our TMQ and um, yeah, hope you like it. Can you tell us what is your absolute favorite thing about your job? What's my, the thing that you do about it? My favorite thing about the job. Uh, that would that would definitely have to be when I create an awesome forecast that's super accurate, uh, really far in advance, several days in advance, uh, and and it changes and has an impact on somebody's day. For example, uh, there will be some sort of uh, a base event going on, and they need to know what the weather is going to be like. And let's say, for example, uh, on that day, there's we're expecting thunderstorms. Well, and I, and, I, and I tell them, hey, from this time to this time, we're expecting heavy rain and thunderstorms. You might want to move it to this time or to this day. And they end up moving it, and there ends up being thunderstorms on that, that original day. And so knowing that I protected people and allowed and ha had a part in helping this event happen and uh, having, having a part in the people having a great time, uh, that's what makes it worth it to me. Well, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. We appreciate it. I learned some really cool stuff. And as everybody who knows me knows, if I learn something, I'm loving it. We look forward to having wonderful weather forecasts all summer. And we appreciate everything you do. Thank sure. you so much, sir. No problem. I do what I can. Just remember when you hear those sirens or you hear those warnings, uh, make sure you take the right steps to make sure that you're safe.